Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the co-chair of the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee um, with the Interagency Sustainability Committee. We uh, would like to welcome you to our first Green New York Sustainability Series webinar. We're very excited about this opportunity to bring a number of different topics to you. Our first topic today that we're covering is Easy Home Composting with Gary Feinlin, who is a composting expert at the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, and I've never seen someone so enthusiastic about composting. So it's going to be a great presentation today. A um, couple of housekeeping uh, notes. Um, you can find a list of all our upcoming webinars on the Green New York website uh, where you registered. We have registration up for the next webinar, which is going to be on greener gifting for the holidays. And um, that is taking place the second Tuesday of December at noon. And we have a list of all of our upcoming um, webinars as well, so you can see what the list is. If you do have any ideas for future webinars, feel free to reach out to us. Um, if there's any topics you're thinking about or you see in the news and you want to learn more about, and we can find an expert in state government to present on them. So we hope you enjoy the webinars. Um, if you do have any questions, we will be addressing those at the end. Please type them into the chat box and we will get to those um, at the end. We'll read them off and make sure that um, that we get to those. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to today's presenter, Gary Feinland from the Department of Environmental Conservation. Thanks, Brandon. It's really good to be here with everyone. I wish I could see all of your faces. Some of you may have heard about recycling being more challenging these days, with China requiring higher standards for what they'll accept from other countries, bottles and uh, other kinds of plastics in particular. While DEC and others are working on solutions to that, we can all take matters into our own hands by recycling our food scraps and yard trimmings through home composting. Because it's one of the few kinds of recycling that we can do from start to finish at our homes. For the first part of the presentation, I'll be referring to a compost poster. It's this easy home composting image right here. And it looks complicated, but I'm going to break it down for you and we'll revisit different parts of it. So here's a rhyme that really sums up all of composting. Making compost takes some care. Add greens, browns, water, and air. If you're in a room with a bunch of people, you're welcome to repeat that amongst yourself. <laughs> it is the secret to compost. So greens, browns, water, and air, we'll start with the greens, and they are a great source of nitrogen. Now, I should say that in this rhyme, making compost takes some care, add greens, browns, water, and air. What we're doing is managing the compost pile or bin for the microorganisms that live there. The bacteria and the fungi, most notably mold, as well as earthworms and other creatures. So the first thing, greens. Like I said, greens are a source of nitrogen. They're also moist. You can see greens tend to be food scraps as well as grass clippings. Greens, the next thing is browns. And browns are a source of carbon for the creatures that live in the bin. Uh, leaves wood chips, straw, that kind of thing, they're all drier and the carbon helps the creatures in a bin because it's an energy source. And I mentioned the greens, the greens which have nitrogen help the creatures in a bin to grow. So you got the greens to help them grow, you got the browns to give them energy. In the upper left of this slide, there's another rhyme, keep a store of browns near add all throughout the year. And what you're looking at on the left is a Browns storage bin. 
in the middle of the winter or the early spring, you're, if you keep adding food scraps to your compost bin and you don't have any browns, it's going to get slimy and it won't compost as quickly and it very well might freeze. A lot of folks, their bins freeze anyway, and we'll talk more about that later. About how much greens to browns do you need? Somewhere between the same amount of each to up to twice as much for browns. It depends kind of how sloppy your greens are. If you're adding something that's really wet, you'll need a lot more browns to absorb it. And to add porosity, which is what gives airspace to the pile. That's just showing that brown storage bin again. So most of us have already collected our leaves and brought them to the curb or done whatever we're going to do with them. But if you have bags of leaves sitting around that are ready to go, you might want to take them back and put them in a bin and save them. So we're missing water and air. And in terms of water, a uh, wrung out sponge is the amount of moisture approximately that you want in your bin. If you grab their composting mass that's in that bin and you give it a good squeeze and a couple drops come out, that's a good moisture content. And it's roughly about 50% moisture. I want to go back to that poster for a second to have you get a look at what the, all those bins look like. One thing they all have in common is the, the hole. So that makes it much easier for air to get in. So making compost takes some care, add greens, browns, water, and air. That is how you get air in the bin, by having holes, also by having lots of browns that allow airflow. And you could see a pitchfork or a garden rake on the right, which, again, helps get air into the bin. So why compost? If you're a gardener, you already know the answer. But even if you're not a gardener, it's still great to compost. It reduces what ends up going to a landfill or a combustion facility, which some folks call an incinerator. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions, adds nutrient, maintains moisture, reduces plant disease. Oh my gosh, compost, it's amazing. So we'll go through some of those things that were listed. Yard trimmings and food scraps are about a quarter of everything that we throw out. And by composting it, we just stop it from getting thrown away. We've heard of greenhouse gases. So when you put your food scraps or your yard waste in your garbage and it ends up going to a landfill, that is a place where there's no air. And if there's no air, the breakdown product or one of the breakdown products is methane. And we know methane is many more times effective at trapping greenhouse gases than, I mean, trapping heat than CO2. CO2 is a natural breakdown product of composting. So even though compost, composting also produces greenhouse gas, it's just much less potent. And that's one of the reasons why composting is much better greenhouse gas-wise. What shouldn't you add? Well, meats, dairies, fats, and oil are all more challenging to compost. They take longer. They tend to produce odors as they're breaking down, which can attract animals. And fats and oils can coat the other organics in the compost mixture and make it harder for the microorganisms to get at them. So they, it makes everything take longer to break down. Can you break down all these things? Absolutely, they're biodegradable. It just takes longer. In a large-scale compost facility, they're fine. And in fact, DEC as well as OGS have our compostables get picked up and brought to a compost facility. And in those waste streams, 
they can take all of it, even chicken bones, whatever. Don't try it at home. So there's lots of kinds of ways to compost. An open compost pile works out just fine if your neighbors and family members won't complain. And if you don't have critters around, I have two dogs. They love composting material. I mean, it could be the stinkiest, smelliest thing, and that's great for them. So I had some trouble trying to especially keep the beagle out of the compost, and uh, fencing did it for me. And in the snow, if you're not going to shovel around your compost, well, then you need even taller fencing. Found that out the hard way. And just because a dog could get in a compost pile doesn't mean they can get out of it. That's fun too. Lots of different kinds of homemade bins. You see there's one that is a three-sided structure that's easy to get in and out of, but of course harder for pest control purposes. A lot of people like a three bin system. The poster that I showed you also had three bins. It's nice because you can have one area for your active composting where you're putting, you're adding things to it. Another one could be a curing bin, so it's kind of finishing up. And the other one could be either a different stage of composting or a brown storage bin. There's more and more options now. It used to be it was really hard to find a compost bin, but now even if you can't find it at your local hardware home store, you can find it online. Also, some towns are offering truck bin sales, meaning that they buy an entire truckload of compost bins and then sell it to you at a reduced price. The Earth Machine on the left is a popular model that uh, is sold. Typically, on the right hand side is a turning bin, which is nice because you, in turning a compost bin could be a lot of work, but not when you have a crank on the side of the bin that helps you turn it. Um, this kind of bin is a double barrel bin. What I like about that is that while one side is curing, you could be adding to the other side. So assuming you don't have a large volume of material, this will suit all your needs. Compost turning bins that only have one compartment, it never gets finished um, unless you stop adding to it at some point. I'll say one of the disadvantages of a turning bin like that, these rotating bins, is that in the winter they slow down and freeze and there's no way to insulate them unless you buy an insulated bin, which really is only good in the winter and the summer, it's going to actually get too hot. And if compost gets too hot, like above 160, 165 degrees, it can get that hot, then the microorganisms that do most of the composting die off. Where do you compost? It doesn't matter nearly as much as people think it does. As long as the site is well drained, that's the most important thing. You don't want your compost sitting in standing water. If compost is too wet, it will go anaerobic, and that means odors. It will slow down in its breakdown and also be smelly. You know, I was perplexed by the fact that when I was doing research on composting years ago, it seemed like half the websites would talk about it needing to be in the shade and half talking about it needing to be in the sun. And then I realized it's a regional thing. So in Arizona, in the desert, it's good to have shade. In our climate here, it's great to have sun. Uh, if it's a really hot summer, even in the Northeast, it can dry out a pile. And so I think a wonderful compromise is to have it relatively close to a deciduous tree so you get the shade in the growing season. And then when it's cool, you're getting sun because the leaves are no longer on the tree. And you need to have a way to add water. You can drag a watering can out there or you can have it near a hose.
unless it's like it's been recently, this summer, <laughs> you really didn't need any water to add to your pile. So let's talk about hot versus cold compost. If you want to kill weed seeds and you want your compost faster, like in four or five months, you'll need to turn it frequently. Now, to kill weed seeds, some people will monitor the temperature, and it should be around 130 degrees for a day or two. And if you see that, and they sell three-foot thermometers that you could jam into your compost pile to check it out. They're not that cheap, though. Most of us, including myself, typically do a more, I wouldn't call it lazy, let's call it relaxed composting where you might turn it over once or twice in a season. You'll still get compost if, for the next year. Uh, if you're using that method, you'll probably want to stop feeding sometime in mid to late July or early August to then allow it approximately eight months to break down so that it's ready for the spring to add to your garden. There is an easier way. Adding wood chips provides a lot of porosity, which allows airflow and getting something. There could be sticks too, like inch uh, in diameter sticks that you've broken up, let's say, with your hands or a pruning utensil. What that does is allows the air to flow from the bottom to the top and creates this kind of tunnel of air that goes through the compost pile and uh, allows the microorganisms to consume that and heat up your pile. As they break down the material, they're releasing the heat. As the carbon bonds are breaking, they're releasing heat. That's why your pile heats up. If you do add wood chips like that, and you'll add them as if you would a brown, then you need to screen when you're ready to use the compost if, in fact, the compost is going to be added into the soil. If you're using your compost as a mulch, then the wood chips are fine. So I like this method because I can get my pile hot without turning a lot, and I screening once at the end of the season is way easier than turning your pile many times throughout the season unless you have a rotating bin, then turning is not an issue. Mm. So we'll take these one at a time. My animation's not working. If you have too many greens, just add more browns and turn the pile. Not enough air, turn the pile. Too much water, add browns, and guess what? Turn the pile. A lot of people contact me because their pile is too cold. Some of the reasons why a pile would be too cold is that they have just added one material, either all browns, like a big leaf pile, or they've added almost all food scraps. And as I mentioned before, it'll get slimy and it'll start to slow down as it goes anaerobic because food scraps have a lot of water. In fact, up to 90% water. So increasing the pile size is a great way to increase the heat. You need a lot of material in order for the pile to be self-generating to keep its heat. And you could add insulation. I'll talk about that in the next slide. The carbon to nitrogen ratio is Important, but it's not something that I want folks to worry about. If you're adding a good amount of greens and browns, it's going to be fine. So here's a picture of one of my compost piles from a while back. And on the left-hand side, that's what it, the whole pile looks like. On the right-hand side, you could see between that green fencing there's a brighter, or the green post, okay? If you go down towards the bottom of the screen, you see silver fencing. And so that is just like one by two inch fence holes, 
and that is there so that I can jam a bunch of shredded leaves or even unshredded leaves in between. So all around the bin is foot spacing. And as it's getting colder this time of year and I have an abundance of leaves, put them between those two fences and there, you can't see that there's an inner fence, but there is right where that green fence post is. And so that will provide enough insulation that that bin will go all year long and not freeze. It's also important to have a top layer of leaves or something else that you're scraping aside to add your food scraps and then putting back to keep the pile from freezing. Fruit flies is a big one. Uh, anyone who's composted inside through a worm bin knows that having fruit flies attracted to your bin is an issue and you have to manage it. And the best way to manage it is to bury the food scraps underneath the composting mass. Mm -hmm. If you have animals near the bin, typically it's because they smell something and you also need to bury the food scraps. Hardware cloth is a great way to help animal proof a bin. No bin is 100% animal proof, at least not usually. Uh, not if you want airflow, but that hardware cloth is uh, great and you can find it at any hardware store. It's just uh, very durable, doesn't rust, and um, is, can be a good tool to help. Yay, vermicomposting. So red wigglers are the key earthworm for vermicomposting. They eat quite a lot of food and they prefer the most odorous foods first. So they're gonna get at it before it really starts to smell. They're eating the microbes and the food each time they're chomping with their mouth. And as they make tunnels, their normal tunnels as they move around the bin, they're also aerating the bin. So that's why you could do, if you tried to do composting indoors without worms, it probably would smell and you'd have to fluff it up all the time to get uh, air into it. Those are my wonderful hands holding my worms. I've been vermicomposting for about 25 years and they are Wonderful companions. People ask me all the time if I name them. There's over a thousand in the bin, so they're pretty much all named Henrietta, actually. You can see two kinds of bins. The kind on the right is just a one layer, and the kind on the, or on the left, rather, and on the right you see a stackable bin. The stackable bin is helpful because it allows you, theoretically, to feed a bin, and then when that bin is full, you just put another layer on top of it and keep feeding so that you just let the other layer that you stop feeding mature. And after a couple months, maybe three months, it's ready to use in your garden. Pet waste. So, Pet waste has potential pathogens, so we don't recommend that you mix it with your other compostables. Could be a problem because it won't be destroyed in the composting process. I mean, this is a joke, but it's, a, it's actual Charles Mingus, the jazz musician, really did train his cat to go on his toilet. I don't think it learned how to pull the lever to flush, but who knows? But what can most of us do? If you don't want to throw out your pet waste, you can bury it. And this is showing in just a barrel with the bottom empty. You, you have to have soil you could dig in, of course. Now this is for big dogs. I have smaller dogs, so I use a five gallon bucket. And then as long as that, that bucket is a little bit above ground level, you could keep adding to it. Now, unlike composting, you don't add leaves to it or other types of browns. Adding soil on top helps. 
So what do you do with compost? Well, you add it to your garden. I, I'd ask for a show of hands if I could actually see you for who um, actually gardens. I think most composters tend to be gardeners. Um, it's great for disease reduction. Compost outcompetes the, the microorganisms in the compost can outcompete some of the microorganisms that would attack your plants. And you could use it as a mulch. Right. If you happen to compost pet waste, don't use it. Here are some resources. The poster that I talked about. Cornell has an amazing slideshow. It gets a little bit more technical. It's, I think it's 60 slides, but it's a really good resource. And then we have an eight-page home composting guide as well. I'm going to hand it back over to Brendan. Awesome. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, so if we do have any questions, um, type them into the chat box. I see that we have a couple that have come in right now. Um, and I'm also going to see in the room here, do we have any questions from the room? Don't be shy. <laughs> So this is a time for to ask questions of, you know, I've been composting and it's not quite right. Tell us what the issue is and we'll try to problem solve it. All right, so we've got our first question here. I've been told that another way to help with airflow, especially with piles that are larger and heavier, is to use PVC pipes, drill holes in the pipes and crisscross and levels. Are you familiar with this? Yes. and that is true. You can look up passive aeration and you'll find examples of that for composting. Um, if you, if your pile is larger than four by four by four, you might need that because as it gets that big, it starts to compact. Uh, unless you're using wood chips, then you could go a little bit bigger because it really allows air to flow in. But yeah, if you had the pile that was five foot high and five, you know, five by five by five, and you were just using leaves as your carbon amendment, I would say, yeah, that piping would be a great idea. Are pine needles an appropriate brown? Pine needles are tough. You know, a lot of people have oaks and pines together, and both are challenging. They both have tannins that make it harder for them to break down, and pine needles are acidic. Uh, can you compost them? Yes, I would suggest shredding them into smaller pieces. Pine needles, because of the resin that's in them, they also tend to break down much more slowly. So I love maples. If you have maple leaves, you, they will compost in six months. You have oak leaves, it's going to take a year. So there's a difference. Size reduction helps a lot as you're allowing the microorganisms to get at them. And so how do most people size reduce their leaves? Running them over with a lawnmower to shred them up. Mm -hmm. Can I get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes, uh, we will post um, the slides as a PDF on the Green New York website. So you'll be able to click through this uh, and also click on the links to the other resources as well. Uh, next question, uh, I came in late. What is the difference between a hot and cold pile? A hot pile is used to get compost quicker and to kill weed seeds. A hot pile is generally maintained above 130 degrees for a day or two, and usually you to do that, of course, you need to use a thermometer. If it's around 120 or a little bit hotter and you put your hand in it, you won't be able to keep your hand in it for more than a second or two. So that's a general idea of heat. Mm -hmm. Can you go over the time periods again for how long to let compost sit until it is ready? Okay. So if it's worm composting, it happens more quickly, so four months or so. And if it's regular composting where you, of yard trimmings and food scraps outside and you're not turning it regularly, maybe once or twice a year, then it will be eight months to 12 months. If you, if you have a hot pile and you're turning it frequently, about six months. Are there any do's or don'ts for use of compost material in the garden? Should you mix it with existing soil? 
do's and don'ts of compost of like adding compost to the garden, is mm -hmm. that what we think? Yeah. Um, usually you add approximately one part compost to three parts soil or less amount of compost, especially if you want germination to happen. Are maggots good for the compost pile and bins? Should meats, dairies, fats, and oils be in their own separate pile? So maggots are great for compost unless you don't like maggots, right? So they will help break down the food scraps. And uh, this year I've seen actually, because we had a hot beginning to the summer, I saw a kind of com a fly that I haven't seen in my area before that produces a very large maggot. Um, black soldier flies, they're called. They need temperatures above 90 degrees for multiple days in order to mate and have offspring. But um, maggots in general are not a problem, but of course, if there's maggots, you're continuing the cycle of flies. If you have a hot pile, you won't have maggots. Mm -hmm. Might you have any tips for using coffee grounds? Coffee grounds people often use around blueberry bushes or other acid-loving plants. About one cup per plant per year is about right. Um, coffee grounds add great porosity on the small level to your compost bin, and those so it will just help the soil structure. People often think they're really acidic and they can't be composted, but they have a pH around six, so it's not actually that acidic, and, and it's fine. The challenge with coffee grounds, if you have a lot, is that they're wet and dense, so you need a lot more browns to get the right ratio. And I want to go back to the other question about do's and don'ts for adding compost, and this relates to what you add to a compost bin. Adding plants that uh, grow by roots, like grass is not advised. Crab grass is fine because that's by seed, but uh, ivies and other plants like that, uh, unless your pile is really, really hot and you're sure of it, you could be propagating weeds that you don't want. I know this is about home composting, but can you tell us a little bit more about what DEC and OGS does with their compost and is it mainly food waste? Uh, so at OGS, they do a behind-the-scenes composting where they collect from some of the larger um, restaurants, and they have bins that collect all their food scraps, eggshells. Uh, I'm not sure what else. It's certainly not the, the biodegradable food service wear because that can be really challenging when unless you have really good education, maybe even someone watching to make sure people aren't putting the wrong things in the wrong bin. There's ways around that. Uh, I'm not going to get into it here, but if someone wants to talk about how to have an event that's fully compo compostable, please send me an email. DEC, we collect our food scraps from our small cafe as well as from the pantry areas that we have on each floor, a little kitchenette, if you will. And so in the kitchenette area, we have compostable liner bags and, uh, and a step can that's right near the garbage can where we collect the food scraps. We also collect soiled um, paper as well as plant trimmings from indoor house plants or office plants in this case. We generate between the cafe and the pantries on each floor, about 150 pounds a day of food scraps that's getting composted. The next question should be, how are you paying for it? And the answer is that DEC is paying for it. Mm -hmm. What do you need to do in the composting process to kill seeds in the compost? I use my compost in my vegetable garden and often get a lot of volunteer vegetables from last year's food scraps. It's about the heat. So I mentioned before that if you're a relaxed composter and you're not going to be turning your bin regularly throughout, what you could do, and you have a nice composting mass come mid-July through early August, turn that pile, try to get that heat up 
And if it's not hot, you might want to do uh, mowing of grass clippings and add that in because the nitrogen helps it heat up. Then turn it, make sure it's the proper moisture, and get a thermometer. If you're going to add weeds with seeds, get a thermometer to make sure you're killing it. What some people do is just cut off the seed heads, throw them away, or if you have a compost program that, uh, you know, where they're collecting leaves, et cetera, from the curb, put that in the curb bin. It'll go to a facility that can process those weed seeds, and you have used almost all of the rest of the weeds in your compost. Can paper towels and other paper go into the compost? Yes, they can. When it's bunched up, it, it's hard for the microorganisms to get at it, so it should be fluffy or preferably shredded. In my area, there are a couple of vendors who will pick up your waste and return composted materials for a fee. Are these companies reputable, and does DEC have any oversight of these programs? Could this be a good option for people who don't have a place for an outdoor pile? Lots of yeses in there. Yes, it's uh, they are reputable as far as I know of, and they are reasonably priced for what they give you. And, you know, they come to your door. I think some of them are around $15. I want to say it's a month, but it might be a week. I can't recall. I think it's $15 a month. And they'll take a your bucket and give you a fresh one often, and they are producing compost or sending it somewhere to produce compost. What parts of that did I miss? I think <laughs> you got a lot of uh, Is there any DEC oversight of the programs? Um, boy, that's a great question that I'm not prepared to answer now. <laughs> And I know there's some of them out there as well that do it via bicycle. They'll have people that'll bike around. They have a little utility bike, so you don't even get the carbon emissions of um, the truck or the car that's going around the neighborhood. So that's kind of cool as well. So getting back to the regulations, mm -hmm. we regulate uh, solid waste that's considered food scraps, uh, hauling based on the size of the hauler. And I'm pretty sure that the micro haulers that would come to your house are exempt from our solid waste regulation. Mm -hmm. um, how and where do you store the compost feed after July and August to save it for the next batch? You have a second bin. So when you stop feeding that bin that you want to use the compost for your spring gardening, you have a second bin that you're adding to, or a pile or something. It's really hard to do composting in one bin. The way to do it in one bin is that when you're ready to harvest, you take off all the materials that are relatively new until you get down to what looks like great compost, and that's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. Being in the city, I don't have access to a lot of browns for my compost, so my composting is slow. I wonder, though, when I use this compost in my garden, is it going to be too acidic or have some other issue that would negatively impact uh, growing vegetables? If it looks like compost and smells like compost, it's compost, and I wouldn't worry about it a bit. Um, eventually, food scraps break down, even if you're just using food scraps, but uh, along the way, it's going to take longer, potentially be smellier. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you can use shredded newspapers as a brown. And and when I say shred, it doesn't have to be a paper shredder. You can just grab it and tear at it into half-inch sheets and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. For a two-tumbler system, should I stop adding greens or composting at all with them in winter due to the cold since they're not insulated? Hmm. That's a good question. And I don't have a lot of experience with that. What I'm going to ask is that people who have turning bins and who use them all year write in into the chat or send me an email and we'll respond to this after the webinar. Mm -hmm. Are leaves that have a fungal infection or some kind of tree blight okay to compost? Mm. That's kind of outside my area. I know that some leaves, like maple leaves, often get that black spotting. I don't know the technical term for it, and that's fine to compost. 
but I, I imagine there's some fungi that are destroyed in the compost process and some that aren't. When is the best time of year to add compost to your garden? That's a personal choice. You know, it makes a lot of sense to add in the fall if you have compost ready because then you can start planting immediately, whereas otherwise you have to wait for the soil to be ready. You have to wait for your compost to thaw if it is frozen and because it will sometimes freeze unless it's well insulated. So uh, personally, I often add in the spring, which is why I, my pile is insulated. But um, in a really, really hard winter, I've spent time waiting and hacking at frozen compost to get it ready. So fall is a great time to add too, and the microorganisms in there will um, just become uh, quicker, become a part of the soil environment. If you're looking for a hands-on experience, where can you look for a backyard composting workshop? What a great question. So they're running them, they, meaning uh, Cornell Cooperative Extensions, as well as some municipalities, typically run these uh, compost demonstrations. And in fact, I am participating with the New York New York Association of Reduction, Reuse, and Recycling, NISAR3, you could look that up, NISAR3.org. Uh, what we're doing is a backyard composting education and outreach uh, event next across the state, and it's tied to International Compost Awareness Week, which is the first week in May. But your first go-to should be to ask your muni or your local cooperative extension. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just bring up the next question here. Keep them coming. <laughs> I've heard that folks have experimented with composting human waste. What is your take on this? Is it possible to compost human waste and not have it contain toxins? Yes and no. It certainly is possible to put human waste in a hot compost pile and render it effectively just compost. Uh, however, the uh, EPA and Department of Health don't recommend or allow human manure to be composted and then used. It's considered septage and has to be disposed of properly. But if you have your own composting toilet um, and then you, what resulted from that went into a hot compost pile and it's just for your own use, I think it's fine. Don't use it on something that you're gonna be eating from the garden, but it's, it could be fine for landscaping. Can I use grass clippings if my grass has been treated with Scott's Weed and Kill or any other Scott's products? Mm. I'm not sure. It shouldn't uptake much of the, that material, but if you're gonna use it for something that you're gonna eat, I don't know. Does cutting up weed scraps into smaller sections help them to break down faster? Absolutely. If you cut them into something about the length of your hand, that's a good uh, width, uh, good length to for them to break down. And smaller is even better. They can add great porosity to a pile if they're in the like five inches to two inches range. And we've got one last question that's come in here. Can I compost zinnia plants when the leaves have uh, powdery white mildew on them? I don't know. That's a homework question for Gary. Mm -hmm. And if you do have um, any other questions that come up um, or you have ones that Gary hasn't had an answer to today um, and you'd like him to look into, uh, the email address is right up there as well and you can get in contact. Sure, typo in that. Mm -hmm. in email. Yes, oh, there's a yep. typo, that's on me. So you see how to spell fine land. And before we say goodbye, um, we'll give our folks here in the agency building, we're in the Corning Tower on the very bottom, one last chance to ask questions. I have a question about the plant-derived cat litter. Mm -hmm. I don't put it in my 
compost pile that I'm going to use on my garden, my vegetable garden, but I do put it around my bushes. Is there any problem with that? She's asking if plant-derived cat litter uh, is okay to use around bushes and stuff. Um, you know, toxic plasmosis is the potential disease that uh, may or may not be there. And so if you have children around, that could be an issue, or pregnant women, it could be an issue. But if those two things aren't a problem and you're okay with it, hey, it's your place, and it will definitely break down. About the worm composting, uh, we heard something about mites be, being a problem, but uh, also are they something that needs to be done indoors? And also, what are the additional benefits other than faster composting? Do you, you have the additional expense you can see to get the equipment it looks like? So the, the questions are about worm composting or vermicomposting. Can it be done outdoors? And here it can't because worms generally want it between 50 and 80 degrees. In Bermuda, you'd be perfect. Um, and then the other question was about what are the benefits of the compost? And vermicompost is richer and it has more properties to fight diseases. So it actually is used by some vineyards uh, for that purpose, and so it's just a higher quality compost. We heard about mites, or are there any other precautions we need to be concerned with if, to look out for? So precautions to look out for when vermicomposting. Um, you know what? Making compost takes some care. Add greens, browns, water, and air. It works any way you do composting. I guess the only precaution with vermicomposting is it's probably a little more important to keep things buried so that uh, fruit flies aren't an issue. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, that one container had a picture, uh, the diagram with this stack of one had, uh, looked like a faucet, like it would be draining water, is like fluids that we had to be drained off, is that to keep the humidity at a certain level? So the faucet or spigot that is in a vermi container, thank you, Brendan, that is shown by that white little spout on the black bin on the right, is necessary because food scraps, as I said before, can be up to 90% water. So in a worm bin, you don't add water you have to get rid of moisture. And so that's one way to do it. The bin on the right would either have holes on the bottom or you'd have to fluff it up, meaning you'd add more shredded newspaper and put your hands in there and really fluff it up to try to absorb some of the water, the moisture. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, one last question that just came in. If animals get into the pile, would you have to worry about their fecal matter? Mm, oh, um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. That's such a small amount. Unless there, you have a big dog living in your pile, I think you're good. All right. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the webinar today. Again, um, this was the first in what's going to be a continuing series. The second Tuesday of every month at noon, we're going to be doing these. Next month is on greener gifting, featuring Jody Smith Anderson uh, from DASNY. So tips uh, if you don't know what to get somebody for the holidays or you want to make your holidays a little greener, uh, we'll have some good tips. And you can go to the Green New York website to get more information, and uh, you can see registration for all of our webinars there. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming.